Hello and welcome, welcome, welcome to yet another edition, episode number 12 of the PEM podcast. Today we're going to be talking about the disappearance of Brian Schaefer. Schaefer? Is it Schaefer? Schaefer. Schaefer. I say Schaefer. You say Schaefer, I say Schaefer. <laughs> Let's call the whole thing off. <laughs> Yes, please, let's. <laughs> Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm Victoria Laurie. I'm your host of the PEM podcast, Psychic Eye Mystery Podcast, with my fabulous, fabulous sister, Sandy, who is my sidekick in, in crime solving. Um, yes, you are. You are. If I called you, would you show up with a body? If I said, if I called you up and I'm like, I, I had to kill someone, <laughs> they are dead. <laughs> would you show up with a shovel? <laughs> No, I want for you there. Well, that's <laughs> fool. <laughs> Show it up with a shovel. Are you freaking kidding me? If you had to, if you had to kill someone, yeah, I'd choke with a shovel. No, I don't want to kill anyone. <laughs> This yeah, is, I, I turned, guess this I write, is starting I write, off really I poorly. Mur- I honestly write about murder too much because like I'm so desensitized to it now, you know? I'm just yeah, like, oh. I don't. So therefore, the, no, the I'm dust. not interested. <laughs> None of it. <laughs> For the record, I'm not plotting anybody's demise. No one's. I, not in a, not in a, not in a, yeah, not yours, Sandy, not yours. After this podcast, we'll see. Um, but <laughs> I might call you up and be like, bitch you're the victim um yeah call is coming from inside the house um (laughs) (laughs) um yeah okay well we got off track there didn't we um yeah no no one's you did i'm just sitting here fictionally yes in reality no i don't know there isn't really anybody i like i'm trying to think of like who could inspire me um you know, Let, let's just like, not go down this path. Let's just well, someone were if someone were attacking you or if someone were attacking me, and like the only choice was, you know, go away. I wouldn't hesitate. Okay. Well, that that's a totally different story. How, how? I you said, just said if I, I said if, if I, I called you and I someone, said, I had to murder someone. <laughs> <laughs> not taking the call. Had I had to? There was a legit reason why they. They met their their demise. Why they're pushing up days? <laughs> okay, fine. I'm calling Lee. I'm going to call Leanne because she would not. She would show up with a shovel and a broom and a dustpan and you know sponge and mop and um, a body bag. She would be there for me. She's my sister from another mista. So we'll just leave you out of it. It'll be fine. Thank you. <laughs> It'll be fine. <laughs> Oh God. All right. What are we doing? What are we doing? Oh, let's touch on last week. Sandy was, um, my very, very, very thoughtful sister, um, had sent me, um, a Valentine's Day Not showing up with a body bag. (laughs) Not showing up with a body bag. Not, not, not red at least. Um, anyway, so she, every year Sandy sends me a Valentine's Day gift and every year I vow that I will send her one next year. And the years go by <laughs> and I always forget. I don't know. It's just not, it's not on my, I just, it's Valentine. I don't, it's not a big deal to me. So, but it's so sweet that you always make it special for me. So anyway, um, uh, her gift arrived and I am over the moon for it. So um, she had said, you know, this is something you can, you can share with great smelling man. And I totally intend to. Um, and okay. So you, you got these off of Etsy. Is that where you got them? Sands? Yes. Mm-hmm. Okay. So it's Kristen's with a K concoctions with a K. Um, and basically what they are, they're <clears throat> sort of dried, um, dried fruit, um, sugar, um, you know, kind of all sorts of cool little things that go into the making of like an appleberry Cosmo, um, or a ginger mule, or an old fashioned. This is the one I can't wait to try. The old fashioned. This just sounds delicious. Or a pear. Oh, pear and fig whiskey sour is totally up my alley. So you fill them like the whiskey sour, obviously with whiskey. Um, the old fashioned you fill with um, bourbon. I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, which is I'm a bourbon girl. So this, one, these two, these are mine. Um, and then the ginger mule. Yeah, I wonder what like what liquor goes in there. Hmm. 
It's a mystery. mystery. Um, and then the Appleberry Cosmo is the one with vodka. This is the one that Grace Millie meant. I think it's just going to down because he's, he's a good vodka fan. Um, so anyway, so that that's the gift that Sandy got me. And she knocked it out of the park. Um, as far as I'm concerned, these are so cool. I actually went on uh, Kristen's website and ordered some more. Um, little little larger size. <laughs> so you just didn't get enough in the first gift. Basket? They have like they have small, and then they have yeah. mason jars. <laughs> I'm like, well, I didn't know jars. if you would like the the concoctions, so I, I Sandy, I'm like, not faulting you at all. Not not at all. This is up. fantastic. You hit it out of the park. What are you doing? What are you doing? These are fantastic. I get to sample these and you know order in the larger size. I'm so I'm so geeked. I really can't can't wait. So they've been kind of fermenting for like almost a week. So um, mm. I'm super, super excited. I will let you know um, Sunday if I either need a body bag <laughs> or if I'm, su if I'm suffering from a, from a hangover from the Kristen's concoctions. Hopefully not. I put, I put good liquor in there. So we'll see. We'll see. Okay. Only, only call me if you're suffering a hangover. Let's just be clear. <laughs> oh, bitch, I'm calling you. I'm just calling you. I'm going to call you right. at night that I'm hammered. That's what I'm calling you. Okay, um, I can't wait for that call. I know, right? You'll be like, voicemail. Ding. All right. So um, that that sets us up for our theme of drinking and partying, which is what our case yes. is about. Oh, God. That was a nice segue. Well done. Well done, my sister. Well done. So clever. So clever. People think I'm the clever one. Well, I am. But sometimes she puts it out of her head. So, um, okay. So we're doing um book promotion time boop, boop. um this is i i <laughs> this is my favorite um i say that every podcast um i really um i san said you know what book do you want to um cover today and and she's like do you have one where a man disappears and i'm like i don't know it's usually you know usually i'm like making the women disappear because let's be honest it's usually women disappearing right mm -hmm. what did you say you said something about um Women, women and men. What did you say? Women. Typically, women are victims of foul play, and men are victims of stupidity. Yes, <laughs> men are stupid. Um, not all men. Not all men. Some, a few. Um, perhaps this guy was. Perhaps um, we'll see. Anyway, um, so I think there's like a brief moment where a man goes uh, missing in this one and school's gone wild. Um, so basically MJ, who's the protagonist um, and she's a ghost hunter. Uh, she heads to Scotland with her crew, Gilly Gillespie in tow um, and uh, to film another episode of the Ghoul Getters. Um, and they come to a, a wee small town in Scotland. Um, and uh, centuries ago, I'll just read from the book. Um, centuries ago, a mob of angry townsfolk changed, uh, chased a witch, her lover, and her five sisters into the caverns. This is, I think, in Edinburgh, Edinburgh um, which has caverns um, underneath it. Um, caverns and killed them one by one. Since then, it is said that every hundred years, seven of the town's residents will perish under mysterious circumstances, victims of the witch's vengeance. So, um, of course, you know, people start... Um, uh, push up daisies, um, right around, right around MJ, um, wherever she goes, murder follows. <clears throat> but, um, yeah, I really liked this book. I had a, had a good time. It's, there's a, there's a really creepy scene in it. And I enjoyed, I enjoy writing creepy scenes as long as it happens in the daylight, but, um, yeah. So check it out, check it out everywhere. Books are sold. Ghouls gone wild by Victoria Laurie. Okay. All right. Well, that's the business. That's the business. We did like a, a little sponsorship. Uh, not getting paid for Christian's concoctions. <laughs> yeah. Um, hopefully they taste really good too. <laughs> like I, I'm a little leery because we haven't even sampled them yet. Um, but I'm sure they're going to be amazing because like the ingredients, I know I'm spending an inordinate amount of time on these sands, but like the ingredients are um, like for the old fashioned dehydrated oranges uh, limes, lemons, cherries, apricots, cane sugar, maple, orange bitters, like, come on, right? Like open this. Ah, um, yeah, that would be me. I might not even wait till Sunday, um, which is a usual great smelling man, man and May night. Um, I might predict tonight that might actually happen. 
I'll let you know. I'll let you know next week. I will let you know. Um, yeah. Operators will be standing, standing by. by. Exactly. So Kristen, if you're out there from Kristen's concoctions, um, I'll let you know. <laughs> I'm sure it's going to be amazing. I'm sure they're going to be amazing. Sure, sure, sure. Okay. Anecdotes. Can I tell anecdotes? Mm -hmm. I had a really, really beautiful reading. I had a lot of like great readings um, this week. Um, uh, oh, and I also wanted to mention, I've decided to do a class now, uh, starting March 2nd and uh, covering four weeks and then another class in the autumn um, because this one I think only has like two slots left. Um, it's, it's almost booked. Um, <clears throat> and I'll be covering mediumship and uh, future forecasting and I'm gonna kind of combine it because what I found is that when I bring in folks from the other side, they have a they have a pretty good perspective of stuff that's coming up. Um, so I can kind of bounce back and forth between what I'm picking up in my client's energy, which is how I read their futures and what um, their deceased relatives and loved ones are also giving me. So there's like this um, cooperation um, uh, kind of going on, which is kind of cool. Um, so uh, I'm teaching a class on like how to access that and how to do that. Um, and I'm super geeked. I've taught a few classes before a few, I taught classes every month for a year, <laughs> like an intuition 101 and an intuition to a uh, 102, which were kind of these elements, but I, ne I never really brought them together. Um, and, uh, I've learned so much in such a short period of time that I'm kind of excited to teach, um, other people kind of how to do it, how to access it, um, what it feels like, um, how to use it. Um, all that good stuff. So um, I'm excited. If you are interested in the class, um, you're, you're going to have to go to victorialaurie.com and click on the uh, book a psychic session, because that's going to take you to the general appointment setting page. But at the bottom, you'll have the option to click on the box for the for the class. So um, I know I, I, if I had my act together, I would like have a separate button on the website, but I, I just don't have my act together right now for anything, anything beyond what I'm doing. So um, again, just go to victorialawyer.com, click on the, shut up, Sandy. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> no sympathy for me whatsoever, none. She's just like, you did it to yourself. You did it to yourself. Um, <laughs> I'm going to Hawaii in April and I have such a busy February and such a busy March and really such a busy first half of April that all I, all I do is like look at pictures of Kauai <laughs> and I'm like, oh man, I can't wait to get there. Anyway, so victorialart.com, click on the book an appointment, book a psychic session. It'll take you to the general appointment booking page, scroll to the bottom, select the class, um, uh, act now um, if you're interested, because again, that, I think there's only three slots left. So get in line, get in good two or three slots left. I'm not quite sure. Um, and yeah, I think it's going to be a fantastic class. It's every Wednesday between seven and 9 PM, um, for four weeks, starting March 2nd, ending, I think the 23rd, um, seven to 9 PM Eastern standard time. So get in there. I think it's good. Anyway. Um, so my anecdote for the week, like I said, I had some great reading, really, really great readings. Um, it's just amazing how, once you open that door, the information becomes um, just much, much easier to get. It's less kind of pulling and trying and more like they're kind of hitting you with it, which is awesome. Um, and I read for a woman who is, <laughs> Sandy, I'm going to call you going so well. It's going to be yeah. a dog. Yeah. <laughs> Still not coming. Oh my God. <laughs> This yeah, recording is going really well, by the way. I think I think our audience is like, let's just oh delete. Oh my God! Why? Why do they do fast this? forward? Like the second, the second um, we're recording, of course, right? So Emmy is just having she's having a moment. He's devouring a dead body. <laughs> Seriously, <laughs> no need for a body bag. Yeah, no. The dog has the body. No, just in the hole it goes. Oh God, Em. Oh, I love you, but seriously. Um, anyway, so. <clears throat> um, Readings this week were fantastic. Really, really loved them. Um, one in particular stood out. I was reading for a woman um, who I've read through, read for a couple of times actually, 
And I, I know it's terrible. I can't. What do you want me to do? I have nothing. I have nothing to entertain her. She's just like being a devil right now. Um, anyway, so uh, my client, I'll call her Chris, um, has terminal cancer. Um, and um, her reading was uh, especially special, uh, mostly because her father and grandfather stepped forward really quickly and um, gave me the feeling of um, we've got you uh, and we're at the rainbow bridge and we're going to help you across. And I'm kind of seeing this um, told from people who cross over that they were met by so-and-so. And it's usually like one or two people kind of like bring them forward. And um, so uh, she, you know, she, she uh, really wanted to know when um, I, um, I'm hoping she has a little longer than I predicted, um, but it's longer than the doctors predicted. So I felt she might be passing um, close to the holidays next year, um, which gives her some time and she's happy for that time. Um, because like I said, it's a lot longer than um, the doctors have sort of already given her. Um, her mother, her, her grandmother stepped forward. This was the interesting part. Interesting part. So her grandmother stepped forward <clears throat> and then I picked up a mother figure and I said, oh, your mother's across too. And she said, no. And I'm like, really? Cause like this one was like mother figure, right? Like in the position of where mother is. So grandmother is like straight up and then mother is um, up, but um, up and close to kind of that. Um, but to the right usually is where they sit and that's where she was sitting. So um, like I kept insisting, gosh, this really feels like a mother figure. You know, I wonder who it could be. Well, it turns out her biological mother died when she was young and she was actually raised by her stepmother. And so she, she considers her stepmother, her mother, right? So her biological mother stepped forward, um, which is cool. Cause you know, there are times where I'm like, I'm not wrong. I know I'm not wrong. Um, why are you telling me I'm wrong? And I think, you know, if you've ever watched like John Edward, um, he gets a little cranky. I've seen him live and oh man, he almost came to blows this one time. Um, and he gets a little cranky and I super understand it because um, it isn't that we hate being wrong. It's that you're getting pushback and the pushback is pretty intense from the other side. So when someone says no, um, <laughs> like, and I go back to the dead and I'm like, they're saying no. And there's like, it is, it is, it's, it's a mom, you know, like there's like an insistence. So, um, uh, sometimes you just have to be like, okay, well, just remember I said that, you know, because like truly just remember I said that. Um, cause I've had a lot of people actually comment, uh, later, send me an email and be like, remember that, remember you said this? And I was like, no, well, this turns out, this is it. So, um, and then, um, what was really interesting, um, cause this woman, Chris, she's such a love, she's such a sweetheart. <clears throat> and I really, really hope that I hear from her from, uh, from the other side. So at the end of the reading, I said, okay, let's make a pact when you get over there. Cause I'll be thinking of you. Um, please send me a, a sign of, um, that you're okay. And I said, what do you want to send me? And she immediately went hummingbirds, which for me is super special, right? So I'm going to get a little personal here, right? So <laughs> I have a tattoo of, um, of a hummingbird. <laughs> I know. Yeah. As I expose myself. Um, so I have a tattoo of a hummingbird. Hummingbirds, um, are, uh, kind of my gig. So I thought that was phenomenal that right away she went to hummingbird. So kind of, um, I, it's not that I can't wait to see a hummingbird because that would be sad. I don't want her to cross anytime soon, but um, I will want to know that she's okay. So I hope I see some hummingbirds right around the time um, that she does cross. So yes, yeah, so that's my that's my anecdote. That's my anecdote. Um, no one dies. You know, John Edward actually has a has a saying. He says, you know, no one dies alone, and um, it's so true. No one dies alone. There's always someone that's gonna um, meet you at the bridge and help you over. Um, which I think is beautiful, you know, I think it's beautiful and it's, and it's so poignant, I think. Um, and, and, um, it, it, it's such a timely kind of thing happening when so many people have, have died of COVID alone, right. Away from their loved ones. Um, so if you are one of, one of those where your loved one passed away, um, due to COVID and you couldn't get there and um, no one else could get there, please know they did not die alone. They were met. Um, they were met by someone on the other side, at least one person, um, probably a lot more. So um, yeah.
that's my anecdote. That's that's all my part. Now, now I'm switching it over to my sister who will not take my calls from now on. Um, could it be a dead body? Oh. <laughs> Click. <laughs> that's love, man. That is love. I'm telling you, that is love. All right. Okay, so um, we're gonna uh, talk about the, the the case of the disappearance of Brian Schaefer, um, which was Sansa told me about this case <clears throat> several weeks ago. It's one that she's been should kind of do, um, and um, I'll give my impressions. But it was really interesting, sort of right away, kind of not what I did pick up, but what I didn't pick up. So um, that's why it was an interesting case for me. Um, so Sans, take it away. All right, so uh, Brian Schaefer. In the early morning hours of April 1st, 2006, Brian Schaefer, an OSU med student out celebrating the start of spring break with friends, disappeared among the crowd partying at the ugly, ugly Tuna Saluna, never to be seen again. Did someone murder this handsome 27-year-old medical student or the recent death of his mother and the stress of medical school cause him to run away from his life? Did he kill himself or perhaps is he still alive? Hopefully Victoria will be able to shed some light on that. No, Born I won't. No, it's a mystery. It's going to have to be a mystery. That's it. Okay. Okay. I take quit. it away. Take it away. <laughs> <laughs> no, don't, don't leave me. All right. Keep going. So born February 25th, 1979 to Randy and Renee Schaefer. Brian grew up with his younger brother, Derek in Pickerington, Ohio, a Columbus suburb. Following his high school graduation in 1997, he attended Ohio State University and graduated six years later with a degree in microbiology. In 2004, he opted to continue his studies at OSU and enrolled in the College of Medicine. Brian told his close friends that despite his decision to pursue a medical career, his real ambition was to start a band playing music in the vein of Jimmy Buffett and honor his love of the tropics, especially the weather and the relaxed lifestyle. On Friday night, March 31st, 2006, this, mar uh, this date marked a turning point for Brian. Three weeks earlier, his mother Renee had died of cancer uh, and Brian hadn't realized how quickly her cancer would spread nor how rapidly the disease would annihilate her body. And while his friends observed that his mom's death was hard on him, Brian seemed to be handling her demise well. That night, Brian anticipated his future, which included plans to propose to his love, Alexis Wagner, a fellow med student, and during their upcoming spring break trip to Miami. Their highly anticipated vacation was to begin on Monday, April 3rd. To kick off the long-awaited break, Brian met his dad, Randy, for a celebratory steak dinner. Randy noticed that his son seemed exhausted from a week of all-nighters and cramming for exams and felt it best that his son rest rather than join friends later that evening for drinks. But Brian felt like blowing off some steam. So he met his friend and former <clears throat> dorm mate, William Clint Florence, at 9 p.m. at the Ugly Tuna Saluna, a popular bar located on the second floor of the South Campus Gateway Complex on High Street in Columbus, which was not far from the OSU campus. Brian had also invited his brother Derek and girlfriend Morin, who is now Derek's wife, to meet him at the Ugly Tuna Saluna after their date at the Funny Bone Comedy Club. But the show ran late and the high school sweethearts decided they were too tired to visit a crowded campus bar on High Street, so they drove straight home. An hour later, Brian called Alexis, who was home in Toledo visiting with her family <clears throat> before their upcoming trip to Miami. Brian and Clint then left, left the Ugly Tuna Saluna and set off bar hopping, visiting several other college pubs on Southern campus, making their way down to the arena district. And according to Clint, at each bar they stopped in, the two had one shot each of hard liquor. Just after midnight <clears throat> at the short north, Brian and Clint met up with Meredith Reed, a friend of Clint's. Meredith gave the men a ride back to the ugly Tuna Saluna and joined them there for a last round. As closing time loomed, the loud din of the local rock band reverberated throughout the bar and the three companions separated. When the lights came up, Clint and Meredith scanned the room, shouted Brian's name and worked their way between the crowds searching for, but could not find their friend. Clint checked the men's room and then called Brian's phone, <clears throat> but there was no answer. When the bar closed at 2 a.m., Clint and Meredith left, traveling down the escalator with the other patrons, and waited outside for Brian. When he wasn't among the departing crowd, Clint assumed Brian must have left without him, thinking he'd probably gone back to his apartment without letting him know. The next day was a chilly 40 degrees, which was typical March weather, weather in Ohio. Unfazed by the outdoor conditions, Alexis, excited about their trip to Miami and eager to, dis to discuss their vacation plans, called Brian's cell phone, but it went straight to voicemail. 
She assumed he was sleeping off his hangover and planned to ring him later. However, all her calls throughout the day to Brian went unanswered. Brian's father, Randy, also tried calling his son later that weekend, but was unable to reach him. Randy traveled to Brian's apartment on Kings Avenue, which was six blocks from the Ugly Tuna, to see if he was there. Everything was in order and nothing seemed out of place. Brian's car was parked outside, his medical books were neatly positioned on the shelves, and his bed was made, but Brian wasn't there. On Monday morning, when Brian missed his flight to Miami, Randy filed a missing persons report with the Columbus police. Having just lost his wife a few weeks before, he now begged the police to find his son. Police began their search for Brian at the Ugly Tuna Saluna, where he'd been last seen. Fortunately, the bar, the bar had installed two security cameras to thwart the area of crime, which gave detectives an opportunity to review footage of Brian's activities the night of the 31st and the early morning hours of the 1st. The footage showed Brian, Clint, and Meredith going up an escalator to the bar's main entrance at 1.15 a.m. On camera, Brian looked like he was having a good time and nothing seemed off. Brian was later seen outside of the bar around 1.55 a.m. talking briefly with two young women and saying goodbye and then moving off camera in the direction of the bar, apparently to re-enter. Clint later told police that he had seen Brian after he returned inside the bar and said they were planning to leave, but he lost track of him. Clint and Meredith's departure is clearly seen on video. However, the camera did not record Brian leaving. A second camera was positioned outside as an emergency exit, and that footage was also examined. Police determined that everyone who entered the bar that night was accounted for, everyone except Brian. Given that there was no other publicly accessible entrance or exit to the bar at the time, Brian's disappearance was especially puzzling to investigators. Detectives theorized that it was possible that Brian could have changed his clothes in the bar or put on a hat and kept his head down, hiding his face from the camera. The cameras might have also missed Brian, one constantly panned across the bar area and the other was manually operated. And while he could have left the building by another route, the building's only other exit, a service door not generally used by the public, opened up at the time onto a construction site that officers believed would have been difficult to climb down and walk through while sober, even more so if intoxicated, as Brian likely was at the time of, uh, at that time of the morning. Officers next examined security cameras from nearby bars, the Sloppy Donkey, Mad Max, and Lucky's Stout House that would have recorded Brian if he had left the building from the back entrance. However, the collective video footage so showed no trace of him. Somehow, Brian had evaded surveillance in a city with more closed-circuit television monitors than its sister cities of Cleveland, Cincinnati, and Toledo co combined. The search for Brian began to fan out from the ugly tuna, with officers sometimes accompanied by police dogs, looking through city streets, inspecting dumpsters and waste containers, and asking residents if they had seen Brian. The search included area hospitals, taxi companies, and even extended to the Columbus sewer system. Flyers were widely posted throughout the campus and the city bearing a colored picture of Brian's handsome face that highlighted his brown hair and hazel eyes and noted his height at six foot two and his weight at 170 pounds. And the description of his clothes he was wearing on the night he disappeared, which included a pair of jeans, a blue or green striped shirt, and tennis shoes. The flyers also called out Brian's two distinguishing features, a tattoo on his upper right arm of his stick figure logo from the cover artwork of the single Alive by his favorite band Pearl Jam and a distinctive fleck in one of his irises. Brian's father Randy and brother Derek along with a group of sympathetic citizens spent much of their free time wading along the shores of the Olentangy River which flows through Columbus and is adjacent to OSU, searching in vain near bridges for Brian's body. Cadaver dogs prowled the OSU campus grounds in search of a body and all efforts ended up proving fruitless. Brian had vanished. Police considered that Brian might have disappeared voluntarily, and with his mother's recent death, it was speculated that Brian had gone away, temporarily to grieve in solitude. Alexis reported that a few days before the night Brian disappeared from the ugly tuna, he told her to move on and find someone else because he was struggling with his mom's death, and that a couple of weeks before that, he asked her to just go away with him. However, once his disappearance proved permanent, police could not find any evidence that supported reasons for, reasons for him to voluntarily disappear. For a long time after he had disappeared, Alexis would call Brian's phone every night before bed. Usually it went to voicemail, but one September night, the phone rang three times. Singular, Brian's wireless provider said that what Alexis heard may have been due to a computer glitch. A ping from the phone was detected at a cell tower in Hillard, 14 miles northwest of Columbus. Those who had seen Brian on the evening of his disappearance, including his father, Randy, were asked to take a lie detector test. Randy and Meredith passed their tests, 
as reportedly all others that were asked to participate, except Brian's friend, Clint. He refused to submit to a polygraph test, had hired an attorney and cut off communication with the police. Neil Rosenberg, Clint's attorney, wrote to Don Corbett, a private investigator helping the Schaefer family about his client's ongoing refusal to take a lie detector test. Rosenberg noted that, quote, if Brian is alive, which is what I'm led to believe after speaking with the detective involved, then it is Brian and not Clint who's calling, causing his family pain and hardship. Brian should come forward and end this. Clint did not have anything to hide, and he merely told everything he knew from the very beginning and did not see the value of doing so again. Many of those who were close to Brian have criticized Clint for not being more forthcoming. Derek recalled, as soon as the detective started getting involved, that's when he pretty much had no contact with anybody. I've always thought he definitely knows something and just won't come forward with it. He believes it is still possible that Brian is alive and Clint knows where he might have gone. If Brian did take off somewhere, if that is the case, we just always had a strong feeling that Clint would possibly know that. Alexis also thinks that Clint is withholding information, but, but believes that it's likely her former boyfriend is dead and did not run off. She said, I can't imagine he would have just done that. In September of 2008, during a heavy windstorm, Randy was out in the yard of his Baltimore, Ohio home, clearing debris as he made his way to his tool shed. A branch blew off from a nearby tree and fatally struck him. Randy was among five people that died during that storm. In less than three years, three distinct tragedies had left Derek without a mother, a brother, and a father. He is now married to his high school sweetheart, Morin, and lives in Canal Winchester with their seven-year-old son. Alexis is now one of seven OBGYNs in her Toledo medical practice, and despite her long-term and at times frantic hunt for a missing boyfriend, Alexis ultimately moved on for peace of mind and finished medical school. She's happily married to contractor Eric Norse, and she still occasionally finds herself online searching for answers that may never come. 15 years ago, Brian Schaefer vanished and left a wake of unanswered questions. Usually with a missing person, there is a sign that brings answers, but Brian's disappearance has remained an enduring puzzle with few clues about what happened to the 27-year-old medical student. Police say they have three theories about the case, but have declined to discuss them publicly. And in March 2021, the Ohio Bureau of Criminal Investigation released an age progress photo of what Brian might look like today at age 42, with the hope that its release could lead to some answers about the disappearance of Brian. My sources for the story include Wiki Wikipedia, The Columbus Dispatch, Unsolved Mystery, 10 Years Later, Brian Schaefer Still Missing by Mike Wagner, The Columbus Dispatch, April 1st, 2016, MailMagazine.com, Kirk Pepe, 2017, and The Columbus Dispatch again, Authorities Hope Age Progression Photo Leads to Answers and Disappearance of Brian Schaefer by Bethany Bruner, March 29, 2021. So what are your impressions on this case, V? So um, like I said, when, um, when you first brought this up to me um, and um, Sans was really interested in this case um, because it's fascinating, right? Like how does someone surrounded by people disappear? That's, that's the big intriguing question. And um, there just wasn't a lot of there there when you first brought it up to me. And I was like, oh my God, this is gonna be the one that like, I can't solve, I have no idea, right? So <clears throat> she's been like after me, Victoria, you know, get on this case, get on this case. And I'm, you know, I'm last minute Lori. That's my nickname, actually. My editors have given me that, that name um, for a reason. So uh, woke up super early this morning and tuned in on it. And um, this is my theory. My theory is that Brian is definitely deceased, that he has crossed over. Um, I absolutely don't think he was murdered. There's nothing surrounding his energy or that night that suggests malice or ill intent. Um, I, it's my theory that he was probably suffering from alcohol poisoning and was disoriented, was out of it. Um, and he uh, was trying to get home and um, either blacked out and just continued to walk or um, I just kept feeling like he was hot. That was the only thing that I kept getting. And I know it's March, at the end of March, and I know it's chilly outside, but there was this feeling like he was, he was very hot. He just became very, very warm. His internal body temperature, I think, uh, rose. And so he was very uncomfortable. It's my theory that he'd walked the extra quarter mile to the river um, and either fell in or like went for a swim um, or uh, uh, I don't know, you know, rolled in, uh, passed out, rolled in something. 
Um, so <clears throat> when you look at the map, like that was my first thought. My first thought actually about him was that he was in water. And it seems there was a theory, right? That someone that um, he could have been murdered and like packed in a barrel or something, right? Yeah, I'd read online uh, in one of the research um, articles that the the most outlandish theory was that somebody had murdered him and put him in a beer keg and then rolled him out uh, yeah. without being seen on camera. So yeah. uh, but um, no, that didn't happen. Yeah, the, the logistics of that are just insane, right? I don't feel that Clint had anything to do, nothing to do with Brian's disappearance at all. I think he absolutely was telling the police and I think he was very smart um, not to uh, be further questioned and not to take the polygraph. And, and the reason is, um, <laughs> sorry guys, the reason is, <laughs> oh my God, we've got to like find a studio or something because this is just, this gets ridiculous. Um, I think so, we should just host it at a zoo. Like, why not? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, uh, a zoo, yeah, right? Because I'll fit right in. It'll be the same noises, basically. Um, <clears throat> anyway, um, you know, there's no reason ever really to talk to the police. Um, there's a guy on YouTube who's an um, outstanding defense attorney. Um, pedigree is a mile long, comes from, I think, from Harvard um, Law School. And he's like, truly, there is never a reason to talk to the police. Like, don't. Um, and uh, have your lawyer do it, which is exactly what Clint did. So I don't think his motives here are suspicious in the slightest. He gave his answer. He said as much as he knew. Um, and there was a lot of detail that he gave. Um, I don't think that there was anything that was counter or found counter to the account that he gave, right? <clears throat> the only thing I question, and you and I both are on, on the same page about this, is whether or not Clint actually saw him come back into the bar after basically 2 a.m., right? Because he's outside having the conversation with the girls, um, blah, 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 blah. And then Clint says that he saw him later. I think that both these guys were smashed out of their minds. They'd gone bar hopping and they'd had um, shots uh, at every bar. They had shots at the, um, I love the name of this, Ugly Tuna Saluna uh, when yeah. they first got there. Who knows what else Brian had imbibed. And remember, this guy is 6'2 and 170 pounds. He's, he's skinny. He's thin. There's not a lot to him. Yeah. Further, he's a medical student, so he's studying every night. He's not out getting bombed, so his tolerance for alcohol is probably right. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I really think that he was suffering from alcohol poisoning, blacked out, but was uh, not passed out. He was blacked out, but not passed out, continued to walk, um, could have had like a walking dream, like, oh, I should go for a swim. I kept feeling he was hot. Um, and then he entered the water and that was it. Lights out. Um, and I don't think they found his body because at the time that he went missing, right? At the time I'm theorizing that he entered the water, the river was high because there's snow runoff. Um, and this river, the uh, Olentangy River feeds into the Scioto River. And the Scioto River has a, has a, is a, is a much bigger river um, because uh, it converges where the Scioto River and the Olentangy River kind of converge. They're out there up to that point, they're sort of smaller rivers and then they converge into a larger river. So the current would have been at that time of the year, the current would have been pretty strong and um, it would have been nothing to take the body, you know, take a body downstream, significantly downstream. Um, if you drown, your body bloats with water. So you sink um, until <clears throat> um, the, until you start, this is gross, but until you start to decompose then the bacteria produces gas and then that's when you float to the surface, right? Um, so I just think that the river took him out uh, down. There are a couple of lakes that these rivers kind of feed it or the Scioto River feeds into. Um, and I, I just think that's where he ended up, um, uh, unfortunately. Um, so I think the three theories from police that they refuse to discuss, you know, there's all this like, there's all this like, oh, something nefarious must have happened. There must've yeah. been like a, a hint of, of malice or whatever, right? They're so suspicious. Ugh, I roll, go ahead. I was just gonna say that, you know, they're like, we have cameras and they record everything and it's exactly. a highly surveyed city and blah, exactly. blah, blah. Exactly. And, you know, it, there were some ridiculous theories that even went as far as um, there's a supposed serial killer called the smiley face killer 
that was um, killing young men and then drowning them. But there was no evidence that that had happened to Brian, no link to it. It was, it was, it just didn't fit. Right. So. Right. Well, the whole thing with the cameras, if you look at the map, right, the map. So the route home from the ugly tuna saluna, <clears throat> if he went around the corner, um, literally around the corner from the ugly tuna saluna, he um, to the east, he enters a suburban kind of neighborhood, right? There are no shops with cameras there. And he could have walked all the way down 7th Street um, uh, to North High Street, which uh, turns into Key, King Avenue. And again, he could have kept a pretty much 90% residential route. And that's kind of the more direct route that he probably mm -hmm. would have gone. Mm -hmm. um, and then if he got as far as um, Sandy pulled up, um, we we're trying to look at, you know, like where, where he lived. We know he lived on King Avenue, but like we were trying to identify the apartment complex where he lived. And there's one that's kitty corner to the Methodist churches, um, where, which sponsored a walk for Brian. Um, and they walked the route uh, between his apartment. The and, med school, the med school, the church, right. Passed his apartment to the ugly tuna and right. back. Right. Yeah. Um, and so if, he was at the apartment complex that we think in the aerial view was Kitty Corner um, to the Methodist Church. It's like less than a quarter mile to the river. Like it's a straight shot. And there's just nothing there beyond that. Once you go past the Methodist Church, there really isn't any structure there. It's just kind of field because it's um, it's the, uh, uh, what is it, Ohio State campus? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, the Ohio State campus. So he absolutely could have just gone a straight shot um, into the river uh, without without a lot of trouble at all. Um, and that's my, that's my feeling. Um, so the three theories from the police, you know, no mystery. One, he was murdered. I don't think he was murdered. I really don't. I mean, who's going to murder him? And, and like, that's messy. And why? And yeah, why? exactly. What motive, right? Um, probably didn't have a lot of money on him, probably using a credit card, right? He's drunk um, out of his mind. So not necessarily a guy that's going to fight back. He's, he's tall, but skinny. You know, so if you're going to take him on and take him out, you're going to leave the body. You're not going to like cart it mm -hmm. right from the area yeah. and there would be blood or something, right? Physical evidence of some kind. So I, he's not, he wasn't murdered, um, disappeared voluntarily. Um, ridiculous. Do you know how hard it is to disappear in this country? <laughs> like I could see him probably doing it. What, what did this happen since 2006? Yeah, 2006. Yeah. I could I could maybe, 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 maybe with a lot of planning, maybe see that he might be able to disappear in 2006. Um, but in 14 years later, please, you're not going to stay disappeared. And his photo was everywhere. This guy was a really good looking guy. So his photo was everywhere, you know? Yeah. Um, cause you know how it is when, if you're pretty and you go missing, you, you make the news, right? So, um, yeah, I, and the third theory was, you know, that he, um, it fell into the river probably and died. And that's, that's the theory. It's like, what makes the most sense? That one, yeah. that is the one that makes the most sense. So yeah. that's, that was my theory all along. Um, and, um, the phone ringing. So when Alexis was calling, Brian, I absolutely think that it rang three times because Brian was on the other side and was trying to send a hello to her. Um, so um, that was his way of saying, you know, like, I'm here, you know, here. but it, yeah. it, it misinterpreted, right? Misinterpreted because she's thinking <gasps> he's got his phone, he's, the, the phone's on. So yeah. I think, it, yes, it probably was a computer glitch, but I think it was caused by his, his soul, his spirit, just to let her know that he was okay. I did not do an automatic writing on him, um, mostly because it's been a week. You put that file on away. You put it away. Don't even get it out. Um, I'm so, just sitting here. <laughs> um, yeah, so I did not do an automatic writing on this. Um, maybe if uh, next week uh, you have you have a great big case. Yeah, big case a, next week. Big case next week where Victoria is not going to be able to wait until the last minute. Victoria is actually no, she is not. This. Yeah, mm -hmm. work on this. Um, for the length of the week. But um, if I have a minute to do a little automatic writing, see if I can get him in um, and see, um, you know, if he's reunited, I'm sure he's reunited with his dad and mom. I mean, I'm sure. Um, and how tragic, you know, for his brother that like yeah. freak, 
week. It was mom dies really quick of, and I love how you say you're like, Just you skipped over it. the name of <laughs> cancer. Myodysplasia. 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 Thank you. Cancer. Yeah. Um, uh, you know, that ravages her body really quickly and she's gone. And then the father, Randy, poor guy is out in a storm cleaning up debris and a branch falls on him. I mean, come on. Right. And then, um, Brian just disappears. Um, I, the poor brother, like that's, that's a lot of tragedy, um, in a very short period of time. So I really feel for his brother. Um, but anyway, so next week, um, if I have time, I'll do a little bit of automatic writing. Um, but tell us what you've got in store for us next week, Sans. So uh, if you are familiar with a area of Glastonbury, Vermont, it's known as the Bennington Triangle. And uh, 70 years ago, five people within a span of five years disappeared. And one disappeared in 1945, a second in 1946, uh, a third in 1949, and then two people within a month of one another in 1950. So the, you know, just like the Bermuda Triangle, it's called the Bennington Triangle. And people have wondered if perhaps there's something really you know, uh, spooky, going spooky on. going on there, yeah. or is, it, or, or, you know, are these cases even connected or is it just a matter of coincidence that they all kind of. Some could it? be connected, right? Some could be connected. Some could be absolute coincidence. They all could be connected. None of them could be yeah. connected. So, um, tapping in, um, I'll be tuning into each individual one, um, which would be cool. So we can kind of, yeah. um, go, uh, one by one by one and see, uh, see what my theories are on it. Yeah. So, that'd be great. Yeah. So looking forward to reviewing that case. But what an All intriguing right. case, Sam. Like you keep finding these like really interesting, intriguing um, cases. Um, so well done. It's really not me. It's, these are all very highly publicized cases. I just think what's really cool is that you're providing an answer that uh, hasn't no, really been able. Cool. No, you're really cool. Do you like my hat? No, I do not. I'm out. No, I'm out. I'm out. <laughs> You're not out. No, thank you for the compliment. You're sweet. You're sweet. We're a team. We are a tag team. Whoop, whoop. You find the cases. I do the tuning in. So anyway, all right. That's it for today. It's kind of a quick one, but um, you know, we're efficient today. <laughs> time to start drinking. Time to, it's definitely, it's past time to start drinking. Um, so if you want to uh, know more about me or book an appointment or sign up for my class starting in March, please visit victorialaurie.com um, and click on, you know, whatever available buttons there are there. Um, you won't be able to find anything on Sandy. Um, talk about being able to disappear. Uh, that's my sister. Uh, she likes her privacy. So please respect it. Um, and that's, guys, I guess that's it. Okay. Well, have a wonderful, marvelous week. We will see you again next Friday. Sandy, I love you, love you, love you. And uh, yeah. Ditto. Yeah. <laughs> you're so mean to me <laughs> let me love you um <laughs> oh god like seriously she is outside of this when you take the camera off she's the most loving wonderful sweet kind person and you know you're giving this false impression <laughs> to these people <laughs> oh man anyway all right guys well We'll see you uh, next week, same time, same station. Okay, have a good one, Sandy. I love you. Okay, bye. Love you too. Bye.